and you're on. Thank you, Tina. Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order. The public is invited to join the remote public sessions and the information to join the meetings can be found on the website under school committee notices and agendas for upcoming meetings under tonight's school committee meeting. Per Governor Baker's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20, the public will not be allowed to physically access the school committee meeting. Members of the public can access the meeting via Montague Community Television broadcast. The extension of the emergency open meeting law provisions were signed into law as Chapter 20, Section 20 of the Acts of 2021. And the school committee reserves the right to implement additional remote participation procedures and will notify the public of these procedures as soon as that's practicable. I uh, begin with a roll call of school committee members. Jennifer? Here. Heather? Here. Uh, Timmy, is Timmy with us? No? Okay. Uh, Bill? Here. And Nick? Here. And myself. Thank you. We'd like to welcome visitors. We're live streaming and broadcasting on MCTV. A recording of the meeting will be available on MCTV and GMRSD website. We would like to welcome those audience members and please remind them to keep the cameras and the mics off. Thank you. This would be an opportunity for public participation, which is policy BEDH. Public participation has been reinstated to be held remotely. We have not had any requests to participate this evening. So therefore, we'll move on to important events. Brian? <clears throat> so in the month of January, uh, you know, I sent out some calendar reminders because there, the month of January has two early release days as well as two days uh, where there is no school. Um, beginning tomorrow, Wednesday, January 12th is an early release day for the district. Um, also, the Pandemic Response Advisory Committee will continue during the surge to meet weekly. Uh, we will meet at 4 p.m. remotely tomorrow. In addition, the Gill School Council will meet at 4 p.m. tomorrow remotely. Monday, January 17th, there's no school for Martin Luther King Day. On Wednesday, January 19th, Friends of Sheffield will be held at 4 p.m. remote. And Friday, January 21st is uh, turnaround in-service day. There will be no school for students on that day. On Tuesday, January uh, 25th, the Sheffield School Council meets at 4 p.m. remotely. And Wednesday, January 26th is an early release day. Thank you. Anyone have anything to add? Once in a while, we'll get an information about another meeting or something by PTO. Um, okay, thank you. In that case, we'll move on to our student representative report. I see that Sina's with us tonight. Hi, Sina. Hi. All right. Oh, I'm sorry, Sabrina. I'm sorry, Sabrina, did you have a question? Just quickly, Timmy is here with us. Oh, okay. Very good, thank you. And she's having, she's having trouble unmuting herself, but she is present. Okay, thank you for letting us know. Did you? Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Sina, just a little technical issue there. <laughs> no problem. All right, so what I have is some talk about the snowball dance that we were thinking about doing sometime in January. It's just right now we have too many cases and it's been decided it's for the best to push it back. So if we do decide to have a dance at one point, it would be during February, probably February 18th, because that's probably the only Friday that works, but we need to talk to Mr. Graves before that and when things are more under control. Um, we were also talking about doing a mini spirit week before winter break to send us off into that week. We were also talking about doing a unified basketball game in the spring, which is just a basketball game where anyone can participate, including like special needs kids. And it's just everyone. And we think we'd get a lot of participation doing that. And so that would be really great. 
Um, so you don't have any fundraisers really going on at the moment. There's going to be one for the Mary Poppins musical, but nothing in particular for like the classes. Because there was going to be a bake sale for the seniors, I believe, but it got too cold to do that. So we're just waiting. And yeah, I think that's about it. We've had lots of participation with like the recent boys basketball and girls basketball games. I know that. And I guess that's pretty much it. Everything's been a little slower lately because of all the cases. So we haven't been able to do as much, but mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Sina, very much. Anyone have any questions for Sina? We always appreciate you joining us and keeping us up to date. Yeah, of course, my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sina. Hey, Sina, I was just curious. I haven't had a chance to get over to the high school. Did you try the bean pat, the bean burger? I did. It's actually a lot better than the veggie burger. Oh, good. Yeah, I was going to touch on that too. Um, me and Mr. Beck and we've and other teachers and staff, we've been working to like get more options and increase the quality of our school lunch, and that's actually gotten like a lot lot better in like the past like week or so like we had about like maybe one or two options before but now we have like four or five sometimes even like six like it's a lot more and it's like good quality food so I think kids are very excited about that like I've noticed people have talked about that like it's a lot better and people are more excited to eat the food we have to offer now thanks Tina great and thank you for letting us know that people are helping to work on the choices great thanks Brian, your report? Yep, I'm gonna hold off for a minute. I just wanted to alert Tina that um, Kristen Schreiber may join on her phone. Uh, I wanted to be able to introduce her, but she's having a little difficulty getting in on the Zoom. So I'll hold off uh, until the end of the report and see if she's able to jump in. Uh, I'll start with COVID data in, the, in our two towns and the other nine surrounding towns. Um, obviously has not been good uh, and it continues to climb. We're seeing a 15% uh, two week positivity rate in the entire state and in Montague itself, uh, we're approaching a 10% positivity rate um, with 129 cases in the last 14 days. As a result uh, of the way the virus has been spreading around the area. There are several additional measures that we've taken collaboratively, uh, in some cases as a staff um, during the school vacation. I'm very thankful that uh, athletes and their families were very proactive in communicating COVID concerns with the school. Uh, some staff and some students were identified as COVID positive and immediately reported their circumstances. In other instances, families of athletes shared that they had COVID positive individuals in their homes, even if their players weren't infected. Um, this prompted uh, Athletic Director Adam, Adam Graves to consult with his coaches on Christmas Eve, and they decided collaboratively, instead of waiting for me to make a decision, they decided themselves to shut down athletics for one week, canceling all games and practices during the vacation uh, in hopes that those, those players and their families would be able to recover and decrease the likelihood that the virus would spread during practices or games. So I wanted to thank Adam and his coaches uh, for their thoughtful approach, but mostly those families who uh, were very proactive in working at keeping other families safe during the vacation. Um, in returning from vacation, uh, I went to Pittsfield to pick up our district's uh, allocation of Binax rapid tests on Saturday, uh, January 1st. And then on Sunday, January 2nd, we had approximately 60% of our staff who showed up to pick up a rapid test on Sunday. And we know the two hour delay on Monday, January 3rd was an inconvenience for some families, but we were able to identify three COVID positive staff and get them into an isolation prior to the arrival of students. So the tests did their job. In addition to the actions taken over and returning from the vacation this week, we had to close the high school life skills program to, uh, this week due to uh, COVID and non-COVID related illnesses. Thank you to Melissa Bednarski and to Diane Ellis for spending much of their past weekend conducting contact tracing. Uh, and I have asked the principals to hold all staff meetings remote until further notice. And we've, all, we've shifted our upcoming professional development to remote as well. The CDC continues to rank us as uh, Franklin County. In fact, the entire state is ranked as a uh, high possibility of transmission. 
Following the updates to the CDC protocols related to quarantine for positive cases, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education updated their protocols to respond to COVID-19 cases. Uh, I provided a link, which is also posted on our website. The primary difference between the, the updated pro protocols and the previous protocols is that individuals may return to school uh, after five days of isolation from the onset of symptoms or a positive test rather than 10 days as required in the previous protocols. And just yesterday, the commissioner announced that the mask mandate for Massachusetts schools set to expire on January 15th will be extended until at least February 28th. Melissa Bednarski has uh, arranged for the state VAX bus to hold its clinic at Turner's Falls High School. Um, we initially were looking for Friday, January 21st. However, um, the state called us back today to let us know that the VAX bus will be at the high school on January 24th from 2 to 6 p.m. with Pfizer vaccines. And a community vaccination clinic is being held at the Brick House at number 24 3rd Street in Turner's Falls on Thursday, January 20th from 5 to 7 p.m. It's open to all eligible age, ages, and the clinic will have the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines available. Registration is not required, uh, but is recommended, and principals are sending the flyer out uh, for that clinic. I did also want to note that our food service director has resigned, and we have posted for the position. And then on a happier note, I wanted to introduce our new high school and middle school assistant principal, I'm very pleased to introduce our new secondary assistant principal, Kristen Schreiber. Ms. Schreiber has joined our, joined our administrative team on December 29th. She previously worked as a teacher for 11 years in the Amherst Pelham District. And most recently she served as a teacher in the Mohawk Trail Regional School District at Sanderson Academy. So I wanted folks to be able to say hello to Kristen Schreiber. Hello, Kristen, welcome. Hi, nice to meet everybody. Welcome. I uh, liked your uh, snow day video. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was she, a very good introduction to you. <laughs> she's still being accused of cheating in the chair race too, by, by Mr. Barnes. No, I, no cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't imagine why he thinks that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have a rematch at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On a vacation day though, no more snow days. <laughs> <laughs> no more snow days. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you, Kristen. You for joining us and, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian, before we finish, um, could I just ask you to repeat the date for the community vaccine clinic at the Brick House? Yes, it's um, January 20th. And when I send my report out with the superintendent's newsletter, um, I will insert the date. Somehow I left it off of the superintendent's report and Sabrina pointed that out to me. Um, so I'll make sure that I get it. I, I've already added it to the report to go out to the community. Heather? Okay. Heather? Um, do you know, will they be doing um, kids vaccines as well on either of those, the brick house or the bus? Okay, great. Yeah, and, and, and on both of them, um, obviously, you know, children five through 12 have only been approved for Pfizer. So the VAX bus may be a better bet for that, but um, they do have Pfizer vaccines and, and uh, it's open to anybody in the community for the 20th. So thank you. And just for the public that might be wondering, um, these are held in Turner's. Is it for any community member in the district or the area? Is it confined just to Montague community members, do you know? I don't believe it's confined just to Mon members of the Montague community. I don't think they're checking residency. Okay. Just in case someone was wondering. Yep. Thank you. Bill? I have two questions. One, on the 60% um, people showing up to pick up the quick tests, what about the other 40%? Well, that's part of the reason we had, a two, we had the two hour delay on Monday so that all staff were expected to report on time where so students were um, kept out for the two hours so that those staff those staff who came and picked up the test on Sunday and took the test at home uh, were able to report at the two hour with a two hour delay whereas anybody who couldn't 
pick it up or didn't want to on Sunday, um, reported to work on time and administered the tests in their rooms or in their vehicles. And then, uh, you know, they only had to report if they came back as a positive. So the effort to report, to do the test was to allow for all staff possibly to be test, fully tested with that test before school started. Before students arrived, yep. So it was all, so 100% virtually was covered. And then secondly, on the new protocol, there's been a, since this was first introduced, people have complained about um, the presentation of it. And my understanding of the presentation of it, and please correct me, is if somebody is out, the protocol is for five days and not feeling bad, testing negative twice, and wearing a mask from that fifth day or any time up until day 10. I don't think, in my understanding, I don't think the 10-day protocol has been abandoned. I think it has been more adjusted. And I would like um, some correction and continuity on that message because there has been at least from for me there has been different information and the continuing of putting out information that says after five days you're free and clear um, is not what I understand the protocol to be thanks That's yeah the, I, so the one thing that I would correct from that bill is there's no requirement for a negative test. Um, and of course, uh, we're, we're still mandating masks when people are on school grounds anyway. So, um, you know, that continues beyond, you know, until the, until regardless, the regardless of, of that, of what the school mandate is, whether it comes from Commissioner Riley or from yourself or us, I think that in general, the, uh, the difference in description of this new protocol has probably been somewhat damaging to its efficacy. And that is what I want to address. So if it, it is a fact that it's five days, you, don't have, you have to feel better. And if you don't have to take a negative test twice, um, but you do have to keep wearing a mask regardless of what our school situation is. And that's what I'm trying to address is continuity in the message, whether it's us or the town or the CDC, whoever it is. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Bill. And you're right, you, the, uh, they do have to be without symptoms. So if, if those symptoms continue beyond uh, the time that they're informed by school nurses or their Senior family doctor. physician yeah, or their or their family physician um, then they still should not be reporting to school for both employees and for students thank you thank you anyone else thanks brian um, moving on to the business and operations report joanne and Kristen, I just wanted to invite, I'm sorry, Jane, I just wanted to invite you to introduce you, but you're, you're welcome to stay, but you are not compelled to stay for the entire meeting, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about the operating statement, what we look like in fiscal 22, and then we'll save the budget presentation for the next section of the report. So that sounds good. So the operating statement, um, there's a couple of glaring items on it. So on the revenue side, you can see that the transportation revenue is in deficit. It's not really in deficit. What I'm doing is moving some revenue down to the transportation revenue account so that we can use that in fiscal 23 to support the budget. Just like we've done for the past couple of years, we've done the same thing. We've moved move the revenue, this is a new revolving account that we can have. So I've moved that revenue that allows us to use it. So in the past couple of years, the first year we moved 100, I think the second year we moved 150, and this year I'm moving 200. 
So that's what, is it 200? Let me just check. Yeah, 200,000. So that's what's putting that, putting that account so much in deficit. And then the other glaring item in the revenue section is the charter reimbursement. And so the charter reimbursement, when we have a significant bump in our charter enrollment, the state pays, basically they pay for the first year of those students. So we get that back in reimbursement. So we pay the full freight, but then we get a reimbursement. So the expense, on the expense side, we're seeing the total cost of all of those students. And on the revenue side, they're giving back some. And our revenue for this year, not what we budgeted, but our revenue is in the range of 400, over 400,000, over 450. So normally, I think a couple of years ago, our revenue was $80,000, which means we didn't have a lot of new students going. We didn't have a lot of students that were in private school that were then choosing to go to the charter school. So this year we had a significant bump. So we have that huge revenue surplus on the revenue side, but when you go to the expense side, we have the same huge bump in our cost. So our expenses way up also. So it really is just offsetting itself. And then the third revenue item is the Irving tuition. So our Irving enrollment is down a little bit this year. And so we have a slight deficit there, about 150,000. So when you add up all of those deficits and surpluses, we break even on the revenue side. On the expense side, you can see that one item where our tuition line is in the red by $400,000. That's the charter. And it's also our special ed out of district placements. Both of those are higher than anticipated. The good news is our school choice is not as high as what we budgeted. So we have a little bit of extra there, but it still brings us a deficit of 400,000 there. So some of the other lines, administration, instruction, support services, we're seeing some savings there, but we really need them to pay for the deficit in the charter and out of district enrollment numbers. Our student support services, that's the line where we pay for athletics, nurses, food service, um, transportation, the 3000 series of numbers. So that, if you remember, we hired a transportation coordinator so this year we don't have re revenue reimbursement, transportation reimbursement for that to pay for it. However, we're saving money on our transportation costs and that's what's helping pay for that. In next year, we will see transportation reimbursement for that. So what we're paying for the transportation coordinator, we're gonna get back 75% next year and then any future year that we have that. So we do have a surplus in that line on the revolving accounts and grants at the bottom of the page, the top line is the school choice revolving and that the balance is higher than what we had had the last couple of years, but we are spending more in fiscal 22 than what we are receiving. And if you look at the heading there, the anticipated expenses, that's really fiscal 22. Circuit breaker revolving is another one of our revenue sources and circuit breaker revolving pays, it reimburses us for very high cost special ed students. So if we have a special ed student that is for in and out of district placement, for instance, and they're very high cost, we get reimbursement for anything over, I think it's about 40 or $50,000 now. So as soon as our cost gets to 40 or $50,000, it's basically four times the average cost to educate a student, then we start getting reimbursement. And it's about 75% of the reimbursement of the cost above that. So this year, our, our circuit breaker reimbursement is lower than it's been for the past couple of years, which is a good thing because we, we reduced our costs last year and it's a year behind. So our reimbursement's coming this year for expenses we had last year. So last year, our expenses were down, this year, our revenue's down. And the balance in that circuit breaker account cannot be more on June 30th than what we collected in that given year. So we're gonna have less to use in fiscal 23 because we're receiving less in fiscal 22. And if you go all the way to the very bottom, 
of the revolving accounts, you can see ESSER 1 and ESSER 2. So we are finishing up our ESSER 1 grant this year. We had used those funds to pay for some positions and we used them to pay for our summer program. But then we later got a, another grant that helped us pay for the summer program that we had last summer. So we have freed up some money to help get us some positions that we need in the buildings right now. The ESSER 2 grant, as you can see, that one goes to September of 2023. So we're gonna have another year for that grant after this year ends. So we're spending about 600,000 this year out of the 866. And then in fiscal 23 and in 24, we're gonna be spending the rest of that and then we'll also be spending ESSER 3. So there's three ESSER grants and each one has, it ends a year later. And, and they get considerably larger as, as we go. So the ESSER 3, I think is like 1.8 million. So it's a big number and you'll see that in our budget presentation. So overall, I expect us to be very close to a break even. I don't expect a big surplus here. So, you know, we're watching everything we're buying and everyone we're hiring because we know that we need to move forward with them and the revenues will dry up. These ESSER funds are gonna dry up. Now I'm hoping our chapter 70 comes when the ESSER funds dry up. And we'll talk about that during the budget as well. Does anyone have any questions on that? Jane, you're muted. I'm trying and I may, if I'm not speaking, I may also turn my camera off. I'm really having a problem with connections tonight. So I'll give that a try if I need to. Thank you for the update. And I know we're gonna go into uh, the preliminary budget for next year, a little bit later in, the, in our business, yep. right? Thank okay. you so much. You're welcome. Um, Moving on to the next item under school committee reports, we have the warrant subcommittee approval. We need to vote the accounts payable warrant. It's warrant number 3219. The date is 1-12-2022 in the amount of $231,341.50. I'll entertain a motion to approve it. Move it. Thank Second. you. And Heather, any questions about that? Okay, we will need a roll call vote as with any other motions that we're voting on. Um, Jennifer? Yes. Heather? Yes. Timmy? Yes. Oh, good. Bill? Yes. Nick? Yes. Thank you, and me, yes. Thank you, so that's unanimous. Moving on to the business section of the meeting. Uh, the first item is discussion of remote in-person school committee meetings, which we've had as a standing item. Um, given how the COVID numbers are increasing, I'm um, assuming that everyone is still content to keep meeting remotely. I know a lot of other boards in towns and other school committees are now resuming virtual meetings because of the increase in numbers. So we'll continue that until and hopefully sometimes sometime things improve. Uh, thank you. And Joanne, fiscal year 23 preliminary budget presentation. And I know Joanne has some slides for us. Yes, I do. I'm gonna share my screen. It looks uh, like Jennifer? there's a hand up. Sorry to interrupt, but it looks like there's a hand up. Yeah, that's Timmy's. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Timmy. Thank you, Jennifer. I don't, I don't know how that happened, Jane. Oh, That's okay. okay. I'm often confused with technology. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Brian's going to start us off with the budget proposal for fiscal 23. 
So this uh, preliminary slide presentation um, includes, Joanne, if you wanna move through. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, giving an overall introduction and the um, three year strategic goals that uh, guide the development of the budget, as well as, as uh, program offerings, uh, some information on curriculum and instruction and assessment, including improvements that we hope to make in those areas, uh, given the pandemic, uh, enrollment and its impact on the budget development, our assessment of the research of um, what we believe our needs are for the FY23 school year, uh, an estimate of our revenues and expenses, as well as a summary and our questions and uh, an opportunity for people to ask preliminary questions. Um, also included is a, a schedule of the budget, a, a more concise calendar, uh, just so that the committee is aware the budget that we're presenting tonight uh, is not a balanced budget. Um, we'll continue to work toward developing a balanced budget as an administrative team by the January 25th meeting. Hopefully by that time, we'll have a, a clearer picture as we hopefully will have received from the state um, revenue, firm revenue numbers. So tonight's just an initial presentation of the committee on January 18th. Uh, we'll go through line items to have those discussions and hopefully by that time, perhaps be a bit closer to having the budget balanced. And then looking at um, voting a preliminary budget on January 25th. Um, we're hopeful that uh, assessments will be made, will be estimated after the state budget is released during the fourth week of January. We're also looking to meet with the select and finance committees of both Mon the towns of Montague and Gill. And we're just awaiting confirmation for a uh, pending January 31st meeting between those groups to share our budget presentation with them. The February 28th, I'm sorry, the February 8th school committee meeting will be a, a, a public hearing and um, the budget will be shared with the public prior to that, more than 48 hours prior to that meeting. The school committee will again meet on February 15th to continue budget discussions. And then on March 8th, um, the school committee will need to vote the budget with at least a two thirds vote. And the budget must be voted 45 days prior to the town meeting, but no later than March 31st. Uh, town meetings this year, uh, are projected to be traditionally the first Monday in May for Gill and the first Saturday in May for the town of Montague. So the, the major pieces that go into building the budget, one is enrollment. And so this is a corrected slide. I have the years when I look at the foundation enrollment. So our enrollment has started to increase since the pandemic decline in fiscal 20 and 21. Um, and then we are anticipating that there will be a higher than typical inflation rate that will be applied to the foundation budget. Our fiscal 23 budget increase is higher than it normally is. And really that's due to the pandemic related needs and our charter enrollment increases. So the pandemic related needs, we're able to use that ESSER money. And we have a very limited amount of time that we can use that money. And so that's what we're using it for to just meet the needs of the students. The Student Opportunity Act is a change in how the state calculates the foundation budget. And so that's continuing to grow. And we expect that could potentially lead to higher state aid for us and for some other districts. And then, like I mentioned, we have the stimulus funds, both ESSER two and ESSER three are used in this fiscal 23 budget. And we have new staffing and resource needs. We're gonna need more PPE. We're gonna need more air purifiers and then the pandemic related instructional staffing needs. So obviously uh, the budget development process is a, is, a, is a public process while the administrative team and the district uh, largely develop the budget. You know, it, it's great to be able to have people who are involved in the school community, either as parents or people getting involved in the school community by helping out at schools 
um, who are able to become more aware uh, either through their participation in the school committee or um, you know, being a parent in the community or a member of the community who's making a contribution to the schools uh, to be able to have an understanding of the, the needs of students in our community. So if anybody has comments or concerns into the first part of the budget development process, I'm asking that they send uh, their comments or concerns to me at my email address, as it'll be easier for me to manage it from here. And so we'll include this slide, that slide in each of our presentations. We go through a process of creating the budget that includes uh, research that takes place in each school and varied departments. Um, that includes um, current student data, as well as input from the various members of the school community who serve to advise the principals in each of the buildings. We go through a process of, of uh, analyzing that research and making recommendations based on additional data that we, that we gather around student learning and student social emotional circumstances, as well as the, the circumstances of families in the community. Um, we review the budget requests and determine the actual needs and where we might actually need to make uh, reductions to the budget to make sure that we're um, achieving a balanced budget while simultaneously meeting the needs of our students. And then uh, again, going back into the process of effectively managing the budget once it's approved. Again, our budget is centered around the um, three-year district strategy objectives and uh, basically centered around those five items that we build, we're gonna be building, we built this year's school improvement plans off of uh, as well as um, and those will follow us through the next several years. So Joanne, if you wanna go through these very quickly. The first of these is uh, the engaging families. Our schools will welcome and engage families as active partners to support the academic and social de emotional development of students. Being able to engage students that staff have welcomed and engaged students as active partners in their learning who take pride in their efforts and make positive contributions to the school. Third goal in growth and achievement, that we regularly monitor the impact of instruction on student learning and make adjustments to maximize both student growth and achievement. Ensuring that we have grade appropriate instruction, you know, in, during the pandemic, um, obviously the expectations for students were somewhat depressed and part of the foundation, the research foundation that we built these goals off of was the idea of getting students back onto grade level this year and looking at uh, helping teachers to learn how to sca scaffold instruction effectively to close those gaps and give uh, the learning gaps that prevented students from potentially having access to grade level instruction. And ensuring that all of the work that we do in developing and implementing the budget has um, an equity lens and that we're moving toward a, a more equitable school, a constantly equitable and more inclusive school that embodies social justice practices, gives everybody access to educational opportunities and affirms all students' cultures and identities. So I'm gonna pick up from there. Um, so we wanted to share some of the highlights and accomplishments of our programs. Um, this is not an extensive list, but we kind of pulled together administratively things that we wanted to highlight. So district-wide, um, we've been doing some anti-bias, anti anti-racist work across the district. Um, this work has been a continuation of work that's happened in the past, but specifically this year, elementary teachers and um, staff have taken part in a professional development series called Brave Elementary Educators Talk About Race. At the secondary level, middle school staff um, and some high school students have been trained in the active bystander program. And the high school students will be screening the film, I'm Not Racist, Am I? with a facilitated discussion by staff. We're also looking at a couple different curriculums and ensuring that when we do look at those curriculums, we have an equity lens. And also district-wide, we've been focusing on the acceleration roadmap that DESI put out um, over the summer. So. Most of the professional learning this year has been tied to that, both the grade level curriculum, scaffolding for students, um, and progress monitoring students along the way. 
And <clears throat> if you look at the goals um, and the roadmap together, you can see a tight alignment between them. So at the secondary schools, um, it says add behavioral interventionists. So this would be something we're looking to add for next year. Uh, universal mental health screenings and skills-based psychoeducational groups. This has been work that Diane Ellis of Student Services has been really facilitating. We've created a position for a prevention counselor um, with funds that we've received through the town of Montague. Those are kind of <clears throat> holistic secondary school, um, kind of looking at the social, emotional, mental health and behavioral components for students. Some highlights at the high school, we have a makerspace. Uh, we do dual enrollment courses with GCC. Um, there's no fees for athletics. This year we've added iReady diagnostics in math and ELA so we can track student progress and growth. And we also are part of the Massachusetts DESE Innovation Pathways Program. And this year we started with healthcare and social assistance and next year we will be adding manufacturing as a pathway. Great Falls Middle School, again, no athletic fees. We've added the iReady diagnostic assessment for math and ELA, but we've also Im implemented the intervention program that goes along with it. So students get access to um, digital instruction in areas where they they find that they need some support based on the diagnostic. Um, it only goes up through middle school. It's something we do at the elementary school as well, but the, <clears throat> the work goes up K to eight. Um, we have the team model in middle school and they focus on developmental design approach, which is really about um, you know, engaging students within the classroom. And this year we have trained our middle school special education teachers on Wilson reading. And so they've started to provide some specific reading intervention for students. Generally at the elementary school, so this is across the board. Uh, so we've added classroom parents in all kindergarten and first grade classrooms. This is really to look at skill development, improve adult to student ratio, and specifically to look at pandemic learning loss. Um, schools have sensory pathways where students can kind of get some energy out as well as um, kind of calming mechanisms as well. Uh, we've added wit and wisdom, which is a very rigorous ELA curriculum, as well as GEOG, which is part of kind of a branch of wit and wisdom that looks at um, students phonics and phonemic awareness and that specifically for K-2. We have an updated literacy plan uh, presented on that last meeting. Uh, we do specific assessments uh, listed out in the calendar so that we can really track student growth and provide interventions as needed. We use Bridges Math and Number Corner. This is the first full year, fingers crossed, of using Bridges. Um, so we've, it was implemented three years ago, but as you know, we've had some starts and stops. Um, within the school year. So fingers crossed, this is the first full year of Bridges Math and Number Corners. We're looking to add math interventionists for next year at the elementary level to mimic the reading specialists that are been working really hard at our literacy program to improve student reading. We're looking to find that balance in math as well. And this uh, last spring and now continuing this year, we have a science STEM special weekly for students. And then some highlights for each school. Uh, Sheffield Elementary has a 21st century after school program. They are soon to be launching their five Fridays of exploration time where staff have put together some, you know, five Friday sequence of some activities like cooking and all sorts of things that really allow students to engage with, with their peers in a different way, as well as the staff. Um, and also working to implement Ruler, which is a social emotional program on emotional intelligence that's out of Yale that um, the principal and some staff members have been trained on. Hillcrest, uh, same with Ruler. They also were trained and they're starting to implement that. We have a no fee preschool. So we have full day for four, four year olds and half day for three year olds. And we also have a specific autism program. And then at Gill, uh, there's a couple things that we could add here, but second steps is a social emotional program that they're looking at. Um, they're also looking to build their literacy assessments um, so that's just a general overview of uh, the elementary schools and the secondary schools. So just to highlight kind of specifically, so in curriculum, we're looking to provide that grade level materials that is both what the DESE roadmap has indicated as well as one of the goals that we've established. But the biggest piece is that scaffolding. So finding the supports to put in place so that if there are learning gaps, students can access the grade level material and do that in a way that supports their learning. 
So we've been really focusing a lot of professional development on that this year. Looking, um, as I said, we adopted a new curriculum for reading and writing at the elementary schools. So that's the wit and wisdom curriculum. Uh, it was purchased over the summer and this is the first year of adopting it. We are looking at some older curriculums at the high school level, specifically in science and social studies and trying to get those updated so that we can have um, more real time curriculum materials for students as things change. And instruction kind of goes back to the curriculum and the scaffolding, but really differentiating. We put a lot of focus in on figuring out what students specifically need and adjusting practice and giving specific interventions as needed. And then assessment, we're building in the K to 12 diagnostic and reading and math for iReady. And it's really allowing us to see trends over time. Um, we're able to look at historical data for the past few years of how students have been doing. Secondary, we've been this fall, we did a lot of focus on common assessments and using assessments to make changes to practice. And then the elementary literacy assessment calendars, uh, again, a big focus for the literacy plan. Um, we are hoping to create a math plan that should be started pretty soon, where we outline what our math curriculum is, um, how we do intervention, and how we create assessments. And so that'll be another thing we'll be able to track over time. So I just wanted to highlight some quick data just to give you an, over, an overview. So this specifically is math. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, as one of the things we're looking to implement. This is one piece of data from the MCAS related to math over the past few years. And um, one of the places we were looking, as I said, was to add math interventionists at the elementary level. And so this is one piece of data. Again, we do have other data such as how students do in their achievement in MCAS. We also have data in iReady, but this is student growth percentile. So it's really each year how a student grows and they group those students together. So, you know, a certain group, you know, a student gets this, you know, whatever, a specific score, five, whatever the, you know, the score is. And then that student is grouped with students across the state who score similarly to that individual and they become a group. And then the next year they measure that group against themselves again. And so that's how they measure SGP, so student growth percentile. Um, so you can see we've been below the state. Most of the time, the state is right around 50. Um, it's interesting in the spring of 2021, they, the state itself overall was very, was way below 50. So you know there was definitely an impact that you can see from learning loss. And again, this is math specifically, because um, I wanted to highlight about kind of the need for the math interventionist. So you can see the, the small difference at spring of 2018, spring of 2019. There were no MCAS in spring of 2020, and then the spring of 2021. And just to point out, uh, another measurement that we did take and looked at was how we compared to the state for math in meeting and exceeding expectations. So overall, you know, student scoring meeting or exceeding expectation. In spring of 2018, we were 22 points behind the state. Same in 2019, we were 22 points behind the state. And then spring of 2021, we were 17 points behind the state. And so that's really indicating that most of our students are sc scoring the partially meeting expectations. They're not hitting the meeting expectation compared to the state as much. So that's just something to highlight as we think about you know, implementing math interventionists at the elementary level. And then the last slide that I have is just a highlight so you could get a sense of what SAT and PSAT scores look like. A lot of uh, colleges, as we know, have, have waived these, but um, it's still something we're encouraging our students to take. We uh, ask all of our 10th graders to take the PSATs. And so just this gives you a sense of the scoring for this past fall um, so for both 10th and 11th graders who took, our, took the PSATs in school and then the SAT trends over the past few years. So how students have actually done on the SATs. So the first one is about the 10th graders. It shows you the reading and writing score, you know, the score is out of 760 for reading and writing. And we did 492, that was an average. And then out of math, it was 459. And then the percentage of students meeting or exceeding benchmark, that's actually really looking at like if they were, you know, to take the SATs, how would they meet that benchmark? And so it's actually a really good indication for our reading and writing. It's a little bit lower in math. Um, and then the final column is SAT scores, the average scores over the past few years. Hmm. 
Okay, so now we're going to move on to student enrollment. So I wanted to just paint a picture of what our enrollment looked like when we were building our fiscal 22 budget. So when the state enrollment numbers came out, you'll remember that we had over 100 student decline, which was about a 10% decline. And many districts had a decline, anywhere from five to even almost 20%. And the green highlighted schools there are the only ones that had an enrollment increase. So two of them in our neighborhood here are vocational schools. That was, and only four to one districts statewide actually had an increase in enrollment. And so the majority of those were vocational schools. They're not the ones that lost the student enrollment, but everybody else is trying to climb back out of this hole. So our enrollment trends, we always look at the students that are in our building. So the second line there, district enrollment, those are the students that come to our buildings to go to school, be it from Irving, from within our towns of Montague and Gill, or school choice from out of the district. These are the students in our buildings. The very top number is foundation enrollment. Those are the students that live in our towns no matter where they attend public school. So they might be choiced out and you can see that number toward the bottom. It dropped from fiscal 20 to 21, from 239 down to 201, but it's coming back up in 22. Now I was hoping that number would stay flat, but it is coming up. And then charter, which is actually worse for us, charter, was pretty flat from 20 to 21. And then it just skyrocketed in 22. So I can go back to when charter schools first opened and we have never seen an increase of 14 students before. But those two increases, the charter increase and the choice out increase are what led to this growth in our foundation enrollment bringing us up to the 1,026. So it's still under our fiscal 20 enrollment, but it's growing. That means the students that live in our towns, more of them are going to public schools this year than last year. So you can see that our enrollment in the buildings, every one of them is relatively flat, but our foundation enrollment is starting to climb. Um, student race and ethnicity you can see that we are 75% white. And the other percentages there. And then our selected population. So low income, we are 60% low income. And our students with disabilities are at 27%. Both of those numbers are above the state average. So then you know, as we build the budget, we need to make sure that we can afford what we need and prioritize what we need to equal what we can afford. So anticipating the chapter 70 increase due to increased enrollment and combining that with ESSER grant and revolving funds, um, there'll be a few things that we'll focus on that are directly related to the impact of the pandemic. One, continuing to assess and respond to the learning loss, both academic in terms of uh, academic and social emotional growth. The need to increase instructional and support services for students with learning differences, special education support, counseling, as well as uh, direct academic support. We need to identify and implement additional interventions for a wide range of social emotional needs and to continue to prioritize building strong relationships with students and families. So we have some new positions that we included in the fiscal 23 budget. In the notes column, you'll see that the fiscal 22. So some of these positions were added in fiscal 22. What we didn't know when we were building the fiscal 22 budget is what the ESSER grants were gonna look like. So we had no idea the amounts of money we were gonna get. And so we were really basing anything we added during the fiscal 22 budget process based on the ESSER 1 grant. And if you go back to the ESSER 1 grant amount, you'll see that it's you know less than $300,000. So 
So that's all we knew about when we were building the fiscal 22 budget. Now, as we build the fiscal 23 budget, you know, we know about SR2, which was 800,000. We know about SR3, which was 1.8 million. So in fiscal 22, once we learned about the SR2 grant, we added some positions. So our first grade paras were added in fiscal 22. That was part of the budget process. Instructional technology we added in fiscal 22. These are positions that are gonna continue in fiscal 23, they're part of this budget. We added an additional speech language pathologist to meet the needs of the students that had not been in school for a year. Innovative pathways teacher, we added that programming at the high school and we added an adjustment counselor at Sheffield School. We also added the transportation coordinator. And remember that will be a part of the transportation reimbursement in fiscal 23. And then we added additional paras at Gill and at Hillcrest for our youngest students. Math interventionist is one of the positions for each of the elementary schools that we would like to add in fiscal 23 and a behavior interventionist at the secondary schools is something that we would also like to add. And then we, we have some needs for additional paras for specific pro, preschool st students and programs at Hillcrest. And so we have those included in this budget proposal. We also have more positions that we did not include in the fiscal 23 budget because, you know, as Brian said, this is a deficit budget. It's already a deficit. So we had to make some adjustment somewhere to this budget from what was requested and where we landed. And we didn't get to a balanced budget just yet. So we have some work to do. So we had a program para at Hillcrest, a humanities teacher at the high school, special ed or intervention teacher at Gill, um, adding a facility supervisor for the custodians and adding a dean of students at Sheffield. Those are things that are not included in this budget proposal. So some of our larger numbers that goes into, that went into building this budget are health insurance. That's a number that's large every single year. So we don't actually get our insurance rates until April. So we need to build our budget prior to the rates being released. So we are assuming 4% increase for our health insurance for both retirees and staff. And we need to assume that we'll have a couple of extra retirees, assume we'll have some additional staff members picking up insurance. We have, are adding quite a few positions. And these insurance estimates are based on plan enrollment in November. So that's about 225,000. Town retirement, each year we're assessed um, for town retirement for all of our employees that are not on mass teachers retirement. And this is like the matching assessment that we pay to the town retirement board. So the increase this year is about 8.6%. It's based on October 1 employees. So this year, our, our employees are probably a little higher or we had a little more, a few more employees on October 1 than we had last year. As we weren't in school last year on October 1st, we weren't in the building. We hadn't filled all of the positions that we were hoping to fill. So this year we have filled a lot more of those positions. We still have some gaps, but we have filled them. And so we, you know, our, cost of staffing is higher and so our assessment is higher. So we pay about 28% of all of those salaries for the non-teacher retirement employees to the town retirement assessment. So that was about a $55,000 increase. We don't have any settled contracts for fiscal 23. Our contracts either expired last June 30th, 2021 or they will expire this year on June 30th. And so we have to budget some funds for our negotiation. So that is in our insurance and fixed charges section of our budget. Student transportation or student support services. Well, that, that's a typo there. Um, 
So our student support services, that's where the transportation coordinator is. So this is in our fiscal 22 budget and we're also including it in fiscal 23, our transportation reimbursement is going up in fiscal 23 because that position was here in 22. And another position that is in this section of the budget is our SRO. So we had an agreement with the town of Montague Police Department for the first three years of the SRO contract. However, that three years is up at the end of fiscal 22. And so we need to come to another agreement. So we've been paying just over $50,000 a year for this position. And the police chief, we met with the police chief and he's asking for us to pay for a higher portion of that cost. Even bringing that number up to 75,000 is not paying the full cost of the SRO, but getting from 50,000 up to 75,000 is still a $25,000 increase for us. So that's the number that we have in the budget. Instructional, we've added 21 FTEs, including our first grade paras, the instructional technologist, all those positions that we talked about on the previous slide adding up to over $800,000. And tuitions. So while we've had some students that have aged out or graduated, we also have had several new high cost out of district placements. They may have moved into the district or they could be DCF placements that we find that we are financially responsible for. And so that line has increased by $225,000. And then charter enrollment, which I mentioned earlier. So the charter enrollment student increase of 14 students, which is the largest one I've seen since charters came into existence. The higher cost, so we have to budget the higher cost, which is like $400,000. So when we have a school choice student go out of district, student chooses to go to a different school, we pay $5,000 for that student. If they have special needs, we pay based on those needs. If a student decides, or the family decides to send their student to a charter school, the cost for those charter students is anywhere from 20 to $25,000 per student. That's a huge, a huge hit on our budget when you have 14 extra students going. So as we said, we had a preliminary budget deficit. It's just under $300,000. So we will continue to work on that to see if we can get this balance, this budget balance prior to your January 25th vote of the preliminary budget. We're gonna move on to the revenue section. So about 50% of our revenues to support the budget come from our local town assessments. About 28% come from chapter 70. And then the 14% from grants and revolving is the next highest one. And that's higher this year because of the ESSER grants. So we have considerably more revenues coming through grants. And then the other pieces, Irving tuitions, just about 4%, our transportation reimbursements, about a percent and a half, and everything else added together, E&D, Medicaid, interest, and then the charter reimbursement. It's just under two and a half percent. So the chapter 70 formula is how the state calculates how much money it's going to give to each district to make it fair and equitable for all towns and communities. So they, they do this calculation by looking at the different enrollment categories and demographics economically disadvantaged students for low income families, special education, limited English proficiency students. In each grade level would be different. You know, kindergarten would be separate from preschool and then you have elementary, middle and high school. So a lot of categories go into, into that. And for each of those categories, they set a certain rate for each cost code. And there are 11 cost codes teacher compensation, professional development, building maintenance. And after they, they apply the cost codes to each of those categories, then they look at how many students we have in each of those categories. 
and they, they build the foundation budget based on that for every single district in the state. And then they, they look at what can each of those towns, each of their towns afford. So in order to determine what a town can afford, they look at the local property costs, you know, what, what is the equalized property value in the community. And then they give that, they assign a percentage. And so for fiscal 22 calculation, they use the 2020 property percentages and they applied a percentage of 0.3326% to those property values. So for the fiscal 23 calculation, they may use a later property value, equalized value. They may use the same one. I'm not sure which one they'll be using. And the percentage that they use there, 0.3326, that will change slightly. And they also look at the local income effort. So they look at the income of all residents in our community. So for the fiscal 22 count, they use the 2018 income. So again, I'm not sure which year they'll be using for this. It could be 2018, it could be the following year. You know, it surprises me each year how far back sometimes these numbers go. And then they apply a percentage to that. So for fiscal 22 calc, it was 1.4199%. And based on those two percentages of the equalized property value and the residential income, they come up with the total cost that each of our towns can afford. And so when they do that, they say, this is how much the town of Montague, Montague can afford. And this is how much the town of Gill can afford. And then from there, they look at each district that those towns belong to and that money gets split up to those. And that becomes the minimum contribution. So I looked back to fiscal 17 to try to come up with an estimate, estimate of what I think our chapter 70 calculation is going to look like. So if you look at the I guess it's a light blue shaded line, foundation budget, foundation per pupil increase in the number above it, the foundation per pupil. I backed into the foundation per pupil, looking at our total foundation budget divided by our total enrollment. So row C divided by row A equals row E. And then I looked at how has that number increased over the past several years? So you can see it that really increases three to three and a half percent each year. You have that one pretty significant bump of 6.7 percent. It's possible we get 6.7 percent this year, but I'm estimating about three and a half percent. So when we go over to fiscal 23 for, to do our calculation, I took our 1,026 students because that's the number we have for our foundation enrollment, and then in row E, I said, how much would the foundation per pupil be? So I assumed three and a half percent increase over the prior year, and then multiplied that by the number of students for our foundation enrollment, the 1,026, to come up with row C, our foundation budget. The next piece of that, so, so you can see the pretty significant increase in our foundation budget in row C from fiscal 22 to fiscal 23, it's an almost 10% increase, nine and a half. The district contribution, that's based on what we can afford, right? So that's what the state estimates based on our equalized value and our income in those percentages. And so that number stayed pretty relatively flat for the past several years, uh, 6.1 million each of those years. And so I'm estimating right around the same number. So we subtract that number from foundation budget, C, and what we get is a chapter 78 number. And that number is larger than the prior year, which would give us about a $250,000 increase in chapter 70. Now, if the district contribution comes up considerably higher than the number I'm using, that's gonna shrink our chapter 70. If it comes in lower, it's gonna make our chapter 70 grow. So these are all numbers that will be out the fourth week of January and we'll have a better idea of what they are. But until then, 
this is my best guess. So $250,000 extra in chapter 70. I'm hoping it'll double, but to play it safe, this is where I'm, this is where I'm staying for now. Another big piece of our revenue is the assessment piece that the towns pay. So we have been using the Montague Affordable Assessment for over 10 years now. And so back in 2010, the town of Montague agreed to dedicate 48.5% of its available revenues for the Gil Montague assessment. And, you know, back in 2010, maybe things weren't going so great and we were having trouble getting budgets here at Gil Montague. So this agreement was formalized into a document known as the compact. And so when we begin our budget process, I check in with the town of Montague to see what their affordable assessment looks like. And then once we know what their affordable assessment looks like, we calculate an equivalent assessment increase for the town of Gill. And until the governor's budget is released and we know what the minimum contributions are, we can't calculate actual assessments. So we use these estimates for our assessments. And we've tried really hard to work with the affordable assessments and keep the towns, both of the towns assessments affordable. So for fiscal 23, the affordable assessment is 11,241,399. Another large pot of money that we use for, to support our budget is our school choice revolving account. So for every student that comes to us through school choice, we receive revenues. And then we can use those revenues to help support the education of those students. So we typically use that to pay for teacher salaries. We try, what we've tried very hard to do is spend about the same amount of money that we receive in any given year or the approximately the same amount of money that we had as a balance at the beginning of the year. So, you can see in fiscal 21, we spent less money. So we had less need to spend that money at the end of the year when we closed it out. And so we were able to build up that ending balance to help us in this year, fiscal 22. And then that larger balance will again help us in fiscal 23, but we have to be careful. You have to weigh that and say, you know, what if it goes down again? Now we're gonna keep having less and less money to use as we move forward. So 927,000 is what we have in the budget right now for fiscal 23. And that might be a little steep, probably a little bit more than I'm comfortable with, but we were trying to get this budget closer to balance. And so this is one of the numbers that we might want to talk about. How much do we want to spend there? The circuit breaker revolving, like I had explained in the operating statement conversation, the balance that we have at the end of the year can't be more than what we've received in revenue during that year. So if you look at fiscal 22, you see that our revenue estimate is 123,000 and then our ending balance is 122,000. It can't be higher than the 123. So it's just under it, which means that's how much we have to spend in fiscal 23. Not a lot more than that. The food service program historical revenues and expenses. You know, our, our budget runs right around $500,000 a year is what we've been receiving. And our expenses have been closer to 550 or even 600,000. And so that deficit that you see there, that's been covered by the general fund for a number of years. In fiscal 21, we had a surplus. And the reason we had that surplus is we had less expenses. You know, the students weren't in the building all year. We had some staff, um, some open positions, but without the students in the building, we were doing the, you know, going out and pro providing meals to students each week in the community. And then in fiscal 22, it looks like we're also going to have a surplus. Now, Something about fiscal 21 and 22 that's different from normal circumstances is the revenues that we're receiving for each of those meals that we serve is based on our summer feeding rate, which is a higher rate per meal than what we get normally during the school year. So 
we're receiving more money per meal. And so when we build fiscal 23, we have to assume that we're gonna receive our old amount of money, the old rate, which is our normal school year rate for those meals. And so I'm dropping the revenue back down to 500,000. But our expenses are estimated to continue to go up between labor and the cost of food and supplies. And so it looks like we're going to have a deficit in fiscal 23. The good news is we have a beginning balance in our food service revolving account that can help cover that deficit. But it's not gonna hold us forever. And so in the next few years, we're gonna to have to start putting more positions into the general fund budget to cover that deficit. A couple of years ago, we did build positions into the general fund to support the budget, but I'm not doing that in fiscal 23 because we have this beginning balance available to us. And then our excess and deficiency, our E&D fund. In this, this fund basically is our piggy bank. It's like town's free cash. We get our E&D certified each and every year. And then we can use some of that money to support our assessments, to support our budget. So in this past year, when the E&D was certified, it was certified at just over $900,000. Now, for my comfort level, that number is a little high. And so in the fiscal 23 budget, I'm, I've, I've increased that, the amount that we would use there. And that's another number that we can talk about because we have to be careful not to spend too much from here because we don't want to make it a normal way that we support the budget. However, we also need to be careful that our E&D certification doesn't go over the cap, which is 5% of our budget. So our overall projected revenues, we've talked about a lot of these numbers. The first one is the chapter 70 state aid, and we have that calculation sheet. Medicaid reimbursement, I'm assuming is going to stay flat along with the contra account, and that's our payback for the Medicaid deficit. And then interest income, you know, we've had more of a, a better cash flow situation. And so our interest has been going up there regularly. The e and going from 150 to 300. Irving tuition is, is just down a little bit because remember we're in deficit this year on that line. I think that our enrollment is flattening, but I need to bring the estimated Irving tuition number down closer to where the revenue is going to be. And then charter reimbursement, while it's a big number in fiscal 22, it isn't gonna be as big in fiscal 23, but until the cherry sheets come out, I don't know where that number is. So that's a number that could move that 250 when the cherry sheets come out. And then transportation reimbursement, you can see that that's increased quite a bit. Now, a couple of reasons for that is that transportation reimbursement is based on prior year expenses. So our prior year, when you go back a couple of years, we didn't have students in the schools, so we didn't, we weren't paying the full amount of our transportation contracts, which means our costs were lower. And so our reimbursement was, is lower in those years. Fiscal 22, we're back in the buildings completely, and so we're paying our full contract. Plus we hired the transportation coordinator, and so our revenue is increasing in that line. And then the operating assessments, the total operating assessment is, um, it's, it's the general fund budget, the regular budget, not capital. And that is based on Montague's affordable assessment and then Gill's matching affordable assessment being added to it. The capital debt for the high school, we have about four or five years left on that capital debt, I believe. And the Sheffield capital debt that was paid off or will be paid off in fiscal 22. So that number drops to zero. And then our grants and revolving, we're spending a little bit less from just the overall grants and revolving, but some of the other ones have increased considerably. Our transportation goes from 150 up to 200,000. The ESSER grants, when we were building this budget in fiscal 22, we, we didn't know about the ESSER two grant. So we only built the budget with 196,000. Now we have since spent more, about $400,000 more, 
by adding some positions, but we're spending over a million in fiscal 23, which is gonna leave quite a bit left for SR3 to spend in fiscal 24. And then our circuit breaker revolving, that number is down because the availability of funds is down. I'll let you out. And then the school choice revolving fund is up as we had discussed. Did somebody have a question? Okay, so the student opportunity act. Back, I think it was just background noise, Joanne, sorry. Okay, thanks. So student opportunities act. This is the foundation budget, which the Student Opportunities Act is a way for them to um, adjust the cost formulas that they put into the foundation budget. So in fiscal 20, they started looking at those formulas and the district at that time had been hold harmless for a very long time, but it was, our chapter 70 actually went above hold harmless, which means we got more than just flat chapter 70, the extra $30 per pupil. I think we got a couple hundred thousand dollars that year. And then in fiscal 21, the Stu Student Opportunities Act really took effect. And we saw an increase of 8% in our chapter 70. I'm not sure we've seen 8% in the past 15 years in chapter 70. So that was pretty exciting to have that bump in our chapter 70. And we were one of the few districts in this area that did see an increase. In fiscal 22, because of the significant decline in enrollment statewide, for us, it meant flat state aid again. No extra money from the Student Opportunity Act. Even if it was part of the formula, because we had less students, it made our foundation budget shrink because a foundation budget is based on the number of students as well. And so in fiscal 23, based on my best guess in the extra 50 students, I'm expecting that we're gonna see some growth. So in a couple of weeks, we're gonna know just how close my guess is. And then we'll move on to the expenses here. So we have a lot of expense drivers, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about what we're, how we need to build this budget, we have to look at student learning options, look at you know, what we can provide to the students. We need to look at inflation, technology and information. Is our technology keeping up? The pandemic allowed us to really get in front of our technology needs and you know, get to the, our one-to-one -one initiative a lot sooner than what we had planned. We have to meet the needs of the students from the learning loss that they sustained during the pandemic. We have a lot of students that live in poverty. The low-income families, as I said, we're about 60%. Statewide Massachusetts, the average is closer to 44%. And then our special needs students, we need to make sure that we're meeting their needs. There's, there's you know, more, more needs than there were in the past. And then our buildings are aging. You know, some of our buildings have needed significant repairs. So, you know, that's another budgetary constraint that we have to think about. So when we look at our expenses, you can see the 2000 series instructional is a 10% increase. That's a lot of those added positions. The benefits and insurance is a 10% increase. That's, you know, the position increases. So the benefits insurance increases in addition to our negotiable salaries that we have in there. And then the big number you see is the tuitions, the 19% increase, the combination of tech school, I'm not tech school, I'm sorry, charter school and our out of district tuitions. And then the capital debt is going down because the Sheffield windows were paid off. So the overall increase, increase here is 2.3 million. Our ESSER II grant, so this is our planned funding, uh, spending for the ESSER II grant. And this should be fiscal 23 at the top of that column. So our summer sports staff, that's a continuation, along with our 
the professional staff and then the transportation for that summer program. Our Gill and Hillcrest first grade paras are a continuation. And then we've added PD travel money in there for people to be able to go out to PD that's available and contracted services to bring in consultants to do some training. And then we have instructional supplies and our instructional technology. And I had to balance it. And so that's where the nurse sub money comes from. It's not, it seems pretty specific, but that's what I had left to spend from this grant. So that's, it was my plug. SR3 expenses. So these are some more continuation of salaries, the instructional technology position, innovative pathways teacher, the high school math teacher we had added a year ago, and then the math interventionist that we want to add in fiscal 23, speech pathologist at both Gill and Hillcrest is a continuation from what we added a year ago, and adjustment counselor at Sheffield, also a continuation. And then the behavior intervention salary at the high school, middle school that we would like to add in fiscal 23. And then, you know, we've added some more PD, more para funds, some tutor money, instructional supplies, sanitation, PTE, and then we have to pay mass teachers retirement on all of the professional salaries. So that will leave us over 1.2 million to use in fiscal 24, and then the summer of fiscal 25. Funds are available through September 24. The next three slides are clear gov. So this shows our peer groups and how do our expenses relate to our peers? So this is the grouping of peers that we've been using for the past couple of years. Some of those names are familiar there. And then when you look at our per pupil spending from fiscal 20, you can see that we are third highest. The only districts that are higher than us per pupil are Mohawk and Gateway. And then when you look at the employee benefits per student, you can see that only Mohawk is higher than us. So we're going to continue the budget discussion. We're going to get you a balanced budget. Um, we'll continue to look at ways to stay on top of future recommendations from the state, best practices, We'll continue to look at, you know, how to best serve the students, make improvements to our programs, look at the data that we have from DESE to analyze where, where the trends are and where we can improve, and then work with the town and the school stakeholders to determine the needs of the district and also the member towns. Well, that is what I have. Good job. I'm tired. Wow, thank you. My my brain is a little fatigued, but I'm yeah. I'm just trying to absorb it all. I, I appreciate Joanne, I appreciate your presentation and Brian's and Jean's as well. Thank you so much. Anyone have any specific questions at the moment? I know we'll be discussing it and uh, questions can come up at any point and will, I'm sure. Jennifer, did I see your hand? Yeah, I guess I had a question about when is it appropriate to ask questions. <laughs> it, I know that we're doing a sort of a specific thing next week and then there'll be the official budget presentation on the 25th. So is, is now a reasonable time to ask questions or should I just wait? I'm happy to try to answer some questions. And if I can't answer them, it'd be good to have them in ahead of time and I can answer them next week. Okay. I just, one obvious thing that comes to mind and it may just be that because there's more ESSER funds, but um, adding a lot of personnel um, using money that won't, that will eventually be exhausted. I was just curious if there's like a long-term plan for how to continue that. Yeah. I think that some of these positions we're bringing back, we're bringing in because we need to get the kids back to 
you know, get the students back to where they should be because the pandemic learning loss. Some of these positions are not gonna continue into the future. Some will, some of the positions will continue and some will be absorbed. Obviously they'll have to be absorbed by the general fund budget, by the district budget. You know, when I'm looking at the chapter 70 revenue, this is not the year I expected to see an increase. But when I look at our foundation enrollment, it's looking like we are gonna see an increase. And if that enrollment keeps growing, and hopefully it grows in our school instead of just choice out and charter, but hopefully that enrollment keeps growing and our chapter 70 will really increase in the next couple of years. And so that added chapter 70 is what's gonna take the place of these ESSER funds. Um, I, I don't think we can necessarily take a question from someone who's not a member of the committee right now, but we are welcoming community questions sent to Brian, um, as he mentioned, if, thank you. Um, and Brian, did you wanna to add to what Joanne said as well? I mean, <clears throat> I think that probably the most important thing right now is in the short term is uh, addressing student needs uh, with people and uh, increasing the number of, of people who have the targeted expertise to help get our students back to where they need to be. And, uh, you know, I'm excited by some initial data that we've received as uh, Jean had reported earlier on um, or in a previous school committee meeting about uh, just the difference it has made have, since having our students in person uh, as opposed to remote. However, um, you know, one of the concerns that I have is we may experience a little bit more learning loss at this particular point in time than we expect because we have a significant presence of virus in the community and there are students who are in, you know, fairly extended periods of quarantine who will need to get themselves back into school after those periods of quarantine and get themselves rolling again. So I think it's a, it's a complicated puzzle in the near term and long term, but in the short term, I think the picture is kind of clear for us. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, and also just, I'll get to you, Bill, in a second, but I think, Joanne, it's also customary if school committee members have a question between this meeting and the next meeting when we go over the line item budget, um, they can also submit them to you ahead of that meeting. Is that correct? They, yes, they can, but I am actually going to be away. And so if those questions could be submitted to Sabrina and then maybe Sabrina could compile them for me. I'll be working all day Tuesday next week. Either either me or Sabrina. So John, if, if uh, you happen to find, you know, my email address or, or Sabrina Blanchard's email address, you can send it to either one of us. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And Bill? Now, Joanne, all those messages are going to be haunting you for the time that you're away. <laughs> and You'll be looking forward to coming back. Oh, I, I am so excited to come back and answer all those questions. Um, I just, uh, two things. One, I did want to thank you all for your comprehensive effort, uh, really, in communicating both uh, your pedagogic efforts and the enhancements, other enhancements due to the COVID stresses for the students as well as the staff and, and the communication is to the community, even in this meeting tonight. It, you've been um, very thorough and, and I truly appreciate it. But I do have, I agree with the notion of uh, when the ESSER money is gone, um, I too have a concern about the positions that have been created using that money. But, I, but instead of, stressing what are we going to do with it, I want to stress the fact that it's possible that to provide a, a really quality educational experience for our kids to continue your pedagogic efforts, as I put it earlier, some of these positions or all of these positions may be the kind of thing that this district should be providing. I'm not saying the district is going to provide it, but I am arguing for what is possibly better educational environments that people or our community is asking for all the time. And the fact that we're shortchanged 
is not our responsibility. We can only act with what other people give us. Um, on the SRO cost, what is the cost? That doesn't have to be answered right now, but, but that is, a, what is the cost? Um, in terms of the charter schools and students, uh, what are the uh, percentages represent? Is the 1.4% representative of 1.4% more than the average, or 0.4% more than the average on the state? I think that could use some clarification, at least for me. Um, and then the 48.5% finally of uh, revenues to the Gil Montague district. Um, that brings me, loops me back to my earlier thing about quality education is 48.5% enough or should we be arguing uh, for more or advocating for more so we don't get into arguments? Um, and then lastly, and this is final, uh, on the building issue, most of the buildings are not owned by the district. And I think that the question there is how are the towns gonna step up and bring their buildings? We're required to maintain them, but we're not required to provide the infrastructure only to maintain it. And it's clear that even though the district has failed in many regards to the maintenance of the high school building as, uh, as exemplified by the HVAC issues that we all discovered when COVID became an issue. Um, the rest of it is on the towns and to, to reflect, to have to reflect that on the school committee's budget or the district budget, I think is totally unfortunate and, but is a fact of life. Thank you very much for your time, all of you. Thanks, Bill. Anyone else have anything to add? Okay, thank you again. Um, thank you, Joanne. You're welcome. Um, next on our item under business, a discussion about addressing issues of equity. Brian, <laughs> anything to update us on? Yeah, Jean is actually gonna do this update for us. Jean, uh, Jean she just has a couple of items to share uh, between Jean and Diane. Hi, Jean. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to update you on some of the anti-bias, anti-racist work we've been doing that focuses on equity in that area. Um, so we were going to be doing a screening for the high school students of I'm Not Racist, Am I? on January 6th. Um, but with our snow day before break, our late start on the Monday and kind of the end of the semester, we decided as a group to postpone that to March so that we really had um, not a lot of things pressuring at that moment so everyone could really dig into this work. So I will update you when we have an official March date on that. We, uh, Mr. Beck and I have uh, signed up for a superintendent and district level staff focus group. So the MASS, which is the superintendent's um, group for the state has partnered with a group called Promise 54, which looks at social equity across uh, businesses and larger institutions. And so the focus groups, they're offering 20 different focus groups across the state and they really wanna know how the, what are the lived experiences and perceptions of school uh, superintendents and district level staff on racial equity, diversity and inclusion. So we'll be joining that focus group on the 19th and we'll see, learn more about it, but we were quick to register so we can make sure that we got in um, to be part of this conversation. Two more things just to emphasize. One is the Massachusetts Partnerships for Youth group, which uh, Diane Ellis brought us to. Um, it's a group that puts together workshops and in-services for staff. And two of them for the high school are gonna, there's gonna be two presentations, one on February 2nd and one on March 9th about uh, racial equity. So the first one that this group is gonna present virtually to the staff is from awareness to action, building an equitable and anti-racist school culture. And then the one on March 9th is conversations on race. And so again, this is a great partnership. This group 
is amazing. They have amazing webinars, amazing in-service offerings um, that we can take advantage of since we're a partner district. And then finally, uh, I'm gonna be conducting a book study. It's open district wide. We currently have 23 staff members signed up and it's going to be a book study of the book, Start Here, Start Now, a guide to anti-bias and anti-racist work in your school community. Uh, it's one of the, it's a, the book came out, I believe last spring through Heinemann Corporation. And it's really a, you know, start here, start now. It's really about how to help educators have these conversations. And so uh, I'm really excited about the 23 people who are signed up to do this book study that I'm gonna facilitate and I uh, will share more of the things we learn as we go through this book study. But I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get this off the ground and running. So as far as my area and working with the staff, that's my update for equity. Thank you, Jean. Diane, did you also want to add something? Um, thank you, I'd be happy to. Uh, I can't recall if I reported to this committee, I know that Brian and I had shared a while back that we had a very successful um, in-person LPAC event um, before the holiday break and before kind of COVID numbers in this community were on the rise. Uh, we also um, had a uh, virtual CPAC meeting. So LPAC is English Learner Parent Advisory Council. CPAC is Special Ed Parent Advisory Council. And um, what we know about equity work is that oftentimes our uh, um, second language families or non-native English speaking families don't necessarily feel like they have as much of a voice or feel as you know as uh, present or accessible in, in being able to communicate with the school. And so the LPAC group and the amazing work I could um, sing her praises all day long of Jimena um, um, de um, Pareja, our uh, Spanish language um, community liaison, um, continues to outreach with families. Uh, the LPAC group has been meeting outside of school. I don't have a report for tonight about some of the considerations that that group is interested in in terms of the budget, but that um, they were quite delighted to be asked about some of their priorities for our district budget and thinking that through. Uh, another, um, the, so the, the CPAC group, um, we are um, putting out uh, a survey to families uh, soon, uh, the documents prepared and proofing it to try to um, better understand some of the topics of concern for our families of children with disabilities around educational access uh, and, and, and which is you know, clearly an equity issue. Um, and the last thing, and we've been getting some good feedback on all of our um, IEPs, we've been putting out a um, parent satisfaction survey. So after a family has participated in a team meeting, uh, you know, did they feel like they were heard? Did they feel like the goals and the vision for their child's educational plan are aligned with their goals and vision? And so uh, did they feel like a valued partner of the IEP team? So uh, I, I feel like we've got sort of multiple things in, uh, you know, irons in the fire, so to speak, on trying to really um, both create opportunities for participation and to gather feedback from our families who may be um, underrepresented in some of our school community settings. So thank you for the opportunity to present that update. Thank you too, Diane. Thank you, Diane. Um, next on our business agenda is discussion of the Commonwealth virtual school enrollment and possible vote. Um, there is a packet included um, on that topic every year. The state notifies us about the number of students from our district enrolled in the Commonwealth virtual school and there is an opportunity to limit the number of students that may go there. That's kind of the short version. Brian, do you want to talk about this a bit? Yeah, in fact, uh, Jane, I, our, our numbers went up. I took a look at last year, which is my only point of reference. And during the pandemic, uh, we were 1.06% last year. And this year, uh, our enrollment in the virtual school is 1.4%. Um, now that may be a result of some combination of increasing enrollment from our district at the Commonwealth Virtual School and or uh, 
overall decline in student enrollment in the districts and therefore the percentage of students who are enrolled increases. <clears throat> what I would like to do is to uh, table this agenda item and provide the committee with last year's numbers and take the time to do a little bit more research to find out um, how many students are actually involved as, as opposed to just a percentage because if it, and if the school committee does cap it one of the things that we know is that students who are currently enro enrolled are not compelled to come back to the district so there's no there's no damage that's done with regard to that but i would like uh, to gather more information from this office to find out um, some more specifics and provide that information to school committee for our first February meeting. The vote needs to be taken by March 1st, so that would still give, we'd still be a month in advance of uh, the deadline for the school committee to either <clears throat> just simply let it stay as we did last year, we don't need to vote, or the school committee could vote to cap it. So I'd like to move this agenda item to February if that's okay. Oh, that seems reasonable. Does anyone have an objection to moving it forward a bit? I think then people can take a good look at also the rest of the information. I think last year, just the short version of part of our discussion was that it seemed with all the pressures on parents with um, COVID to figure out how to be able to help their children remotely and in a hybrid situation that um, we had thought it just made sense not to think about capping it while things were so difficult for families to maneuver with. I think we're in a better position now, so we can think about that um, when Brian gets us the information. Bill? Yeah, um, Brian, do you know how close, you know the, the early grades and then the middle school, high school have separate numbers um, allow maximum number of students allowed in the virtual program do you know how close the those numbers are to their maximums at this time the um the state uh, uh in this document the state won't allow any district to have more than two percent of its total population so there's a state cap individual school committees can vote a cap of one um as far as the the virtual schools themselves and they manage the cap like any other, they manage each grade like any other school so they can no, only no, no. Pick, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I think that the that one number is like 1300 students can be enrolled statewide in a, in a pro in a virtual program a virtual school program mm -hmm. do we know is there information out now as to how close the virtual academies, I'll, I'll call them schools, how close they are to their maximum levels, which have not been increased. And I think people have, um, at least some people uh, have hesitated to increase that number, wanting to see perhaps how successful the virtual education is. But that's another story. Um, I'm just, you know, if, if they're Part of the reasoning behind the question is if we're, for one, if the history of Gil Montague is not supplying a lot of kids, students to the virtual system, then the increase recently may be imperceptible over, over time, a longer time in terms of an aberration above 1%. And um, I guess I'm just, hesitant to question people wanting to go the virtual route when our numbers are so low uh, that we would need to take action. But part of that formula has to be how close is the virtual school to be in full anyway. So it can't accept, doesn't matter who applies, they can't accept more than 1,100 kids or 1,300, depending on which level they're at. Thanks. All right, I'll ask that question as well, Bill. Thank you, anyone else? Okay, the next item on our business section is a discussion about the school resource officer. Again, there is a packet in, um, in our information this evening. And Brian, do you want to lead into that? 
Yeah, I wanted, <clears throat> so I provided a packet that includes um, some notes on the school resource officer from uh, the conversations that I've had uh, in the two years that I've been here, um, not just with Dan, but also with the chief, uh, with other, other educators, including the previous and current principal, as well as, um, you know, in, in my contacts at the district attorney's office and at probation. And um, I wanted to just give a little bit more information about uh, what our school resource officer does. Dan Miner, Officer Dan Miner did also provide me with part of this um, with the current MOA, as well as the MOA for uh, his uh, comfort dog team, Mac. There's also an MOA for the dog, which I thought was kind of interesting. So I did include that. It doesn't have a picture of the dog, but, um, and also to share some things that uh, Dan planned. So I just wanted to share, I'll share a little bit of this verbally. Um, Officer Minor, our school resource officer serves as a liaison to the probation office and is able to provide additional support and communication to both the school and families and assist families <clears throat> in more effectively communicating with the school or, the, or vice versa. He attends student support team meetings and he attends relevant IEP or 504 team meetings if he's an identified resource on the team. Um, he has been used as in, in certain cases as an incentive for some students to um, achieve certain uh, thresholds so that they earn uh, time with Officer Minor. Uh, he primarily takes care of on-campus coordination of the deployment of public safety per personnel when emergency services are required, in particular for medical issues, uh, but that would be the case for any issue. He coordinates the calendar of safety drills with the Mass State Police, as well as local and regional public safety personnel. Um, this, this has been a benefit that Officer Minor has provided since Mac uh, has entered, uh, joined us on the scene. But there are often times when students in crisis become nonverbal or might shut down. Um, and this has been the case at every school. Mac has proven to be a, a really effective tool uh, that students can spend, they'll spend a little bit of time with Mac and, and emerge uh, to be able to more effectively interact uh, with the adults to be able to provide them with support. In, uh, Mac also serves as an effective resource to assist with the de-escalation of students who might be in crisis or might be dysregulated. Um, there have been a, a, a handful of cases where a positive relationship that he has developed with students and the trust that he has as a member of the school community has resulted in cases of, of uh, students in the building reporting, privately reporting criminal activity that occurred outside of school and in the community to Officer Minor. And these are cases which it was highly unlikely that these students would have reported these potentially criminal activities by calling the police or going to the police station. Um, as a result, those students got the support that they needed um, and law enforcement was able to take action in, including um, supporting the family in those cases and uh, moving to prosecute those who committed the crimes. Officer Minor has a really strong understanding of the challenges faced by many families in the community. And in some cases, he's able to serve as a liaison to the school in communicating with families that might face significant challenges. In this role, when support is needed for families, Officer Minor has been able to fast track supports such as rehabilitation program for students and or family members. Uh, he's taught several topics in classes uh, as a guest speaker, including the Mass Child, Massachusetts Juvenile Justice Reform Act, operating under the influence alcohol and drug laws, as well as uh, sharing information with classes about domestic violence laws. In addition, Officer Minor has led a group called the Young Men's Club, which uh, has not met since COVID hit. This group would meet Fridays during lunch and the group would talk about various life events with a group of young adults uh, every young person that joined that group has graduated. And Officer Minor co-chairs and he's a co-founder of the group called Helping Hands. And combined with the School Athletic Leadership Council, this group has helped feed many families in our school district. For the future, Officer Minor hopes to restart the Young, young Men's Club to create the Young Persons Club to offer mentorship and support for students facing challenges in, to completing their education. We're exploring the possibility of having our school resource officer teach introductory courses in public safety and first responder skills. And he was hoping to begin a reading with Mac program at the elementary schools. 
and plans to do so this year once the virus, um, the levels of presence of the virus abate uh, over the course of the year and keeping fingers crossed that that happens. And so that's just a, a brief summary of uh, the reasons why I'm advocating for the school resource officer, along with some information um, provided by Dan and uh, the chief. Um, Heather? Thanks, Brian. So uh, there's no question Dan is an asset to um, our community. Um, I, in looking at this list, I just feel like so much of it <laughs> um, would just be wonderful volunteer, volunteer opportunities for people. Um, that said, I have a, a couple points that are um, that I just want to make. So um, I know that chapter 253 has um, required a superintendent report every August about um, cost, um, talking about budgets for mental and social and emotional health support and school-based arrests and other numbers like that. I don't, have we had that yet? I don't know if that, I can't tell when that went into effect. It seems like it's pretty new. <laughs> I'll have to do I'll have to do research on that, Heather, to to find out. But Dan, I did ask the question. Uh, Dan has never made an arrest uh, at school. Um, also, I, yeah. So that's part of the efficacy, which is just really important to me, considering um, the big funding change where we would essentially have to take on the full cost. Now, when this went to town meeting, it was a one right, a one vote win. Um, in support of it, and that was at half cost. So I just, I don't think just taking on that cost automatically um, is something we should take lightly. It was just such a contended issue at town meeting. Um, I'd love to get in the efficacy. I suppose I'd love to have something like a survey of students and staff, just what do they know about the program? Are they comfortable? Um, approaching him with serious things. I know that some people are, but I'd just like to know the full data um, and if they feel safer in the school. And I'm just wondering who does his performance reviews? I believe that's articulated in the uh, memorandum of understanding. Yeah. And so are those public once they're done considering he's, well, he's not a school employee, but I'm not sure if okay. I'm not sure if they're public. I, I, that because his primary <clears throat> his primary uh, supervisors uh, still remain uh, the chief of police. And Worcester just got rid of all their SROs. It's just something that's coming up more and more. Um, a lot of um, there are just a lot of questions with equity. I, we are in a small a much, much smaller district. So I'm not saying we have the same issues, but I'm not saying we don't have some of the same issues. And I, I just think that it needs more questioning. Okay. I, I'd be, I think the most important part of that, we can, we'll go through the costs and what's changed and why specifically in the light, line items at the next school committee meeting. Um, and I will work with Christopher uh, and Chrissy on getting together a survey for students and staff, you said? Sure, I mean, whoever's in the building, I suppose. Okay. Staff are important. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Bill? Yeah, I, I wanna preface, I get to, thank you, Heather, I get to come back to the cost issue too, but I wanna preface it with saying that I support the, the position, um, what I wanna, and I, and I think that the benefits of it uh, as demonstrated by the recent history since we in initiated the program, the position um, have been beneficial to, to both the town and the district and the students within the district, as well as to Mac who gets lots of attention. But on the cost thing, my question is about why are we going, if it's going from 50 to 75, what is the actual cost to the town? That's what I meant to Joanne when I said, what's the cost for the SRO? 
But I also want to emphasize that the, for me, from my perspective, the officer, whether he's armed or unarmed, um, talking with kids or just monitoring activities that go on, he's actually acting um, for the whole town of Montague. And he's also acting in a venue that probably has the highest concentration of citizens of the town of Montague. So I can't understand, frankly, why the town of Montague expects the district to pay the balance of this officer's uh, salary. We're already contributing at least 50%, and, I, and maybe it's more, but I don't know their salary range. And I just think the mindset here is a little bit wrong. It's, it's if Montague's police department is having a trouble with their budget, so are we, uh, even though we're just presenting it. So I can't get behind that aspect of this one position. I can fully support the position itself. And maybe Montague ought to go and start having a discussion with the town of Gill, which isn't gonna make me popular in the town of Gill, but maybe the town of Gill should be contributing a couple of thousand dollars, which we can barely afford um, to, the, to the police department in the town of Montague. And maybe that'd make them happy, but I won't guarantee it for the town. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Anyone else? Joanne? Yeah, I just wanted to answer the question for Bill. The total cost, including benefits and everything, is closer to 93000 So the seventy five is isn't all of it. And also just to touch on the town of Gill, by the town of, by, by Gill Montague paying. I know, we already pay budget. our share. Thank you. Right. <laughs> We're right. So the issue, the issue as I see it, is a 48.5% that Montague allocates toward the district, right? So now we're paying a larger amount of this budget, but we're not getting more of the 48.5%. Yeah. So. I'll go with that. Heather? I'm assuming it's a drop in the bucket, Joanne, but does that also include the stipend for MAC? Yes, it does. We pay for Mac too. <laughs> but not as food or treats or anything like that. So no. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's an important discussion to keep having. I think it's um it's something Brian will bring us back more information. And there is a whole packet of information there for us to look at more than once, I think, to absorb it all. Um, I think it's it's interesting because I I see the position on paper and then I see the person and it's hard to, I can't at this point imagine someone else in that position. I mean, I think it's so, I mean, the match just uh, to me just seems quite well done. Jennifer? Yeah, that is a good point. Um, I was gonna stay silent for this part of the conversation. <laughs> But that is a good point. Is the contract specific to the to Dan Miner, or is it? Could there? Is it possible that that the person you know there might be a personnel change, um, sort of mid contract or whatever? Historically, uh, the SRO position was started quite a few years ago. I'm not remembering how many, but over the years we have had at least two different SROs. And then there was a gap when we didn't have one. And then um, when it started up again, Dan was the officer appointed. So at times it has been someone else. Um, but then I, I think actually some of the um, information on what the responsibilities are, I think that probably changed with time as well. I, I probably should have done a little more research on that, but I know we did, I do remember, um, more than several years ago, we did have a different resource officer and um, and that's changed over time. Yeah, and this, so this, um, 
this memorandum of understanding that was written that hired Dan, while not specific to Dan, probably did have uh, him or somebody with his training in mind because there are really specific components of, of um, conduct interaction training that may not have been in previous memorandums of understanding. And, and this, this MOA is actually something that we copied uh, when I was the principal at Hopkins Academy for our SRO. And when we didn't have the opportunity really to have an SRO um, in the building or on campus, it had to do with the fact that we didn't have people who were trained and, and the limitations that um, are provided within that um, MOU that there, it's, it's much more specific than just having a police officer on campus. Yeah. Um, there are really specific things that, that uh, Officer Minor had done, uh, has done since then. And as part of the fact that he's a member of this community also make him a great fit for the position. But no, um, <clears throat> if it were not Officer Minor, there are mechanisms in there for the schools to be able to work with the police chief uh, that if somebody doesn't have the training per se that we, we may not we may not, they may, we may not see the sim similar or same benefits. Yeah. Um, I generally am a fan of <laughs> community engagement at all levels. And I think that, um, you know, police community engagement, both at schools and businesses or mm -hmm. whatever. I have the opinion of having, seeing that as a benefit um, while at the same time, I don't have enough information and it feels biased in some way. So I'm going to like withhold any editorial comments, <laughs> but I would say that I think for, um, some person, like, it sounds like he is a good fit. It seems like the feedback is consistently positive and I, you know, cursory read through the contract. I feel like there's definitely some, a lot of upside. Um, but I could also see where a different person who, who might also have the skills, meaning like they can check the boxes, they did the training or this or that, but like maybe not the same kind of personality. So for what that's worth, those are my, my yep. two cents. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Anyone else? I can't see everyone. So if somebody has a question and I'm not seeing them, they could kind of speak up, Heather? I just want to make it clear. Um, the role is fine. I don't think it needs to be in house. And uh, with the fact that if you don't have the funds, you don't need to have one in house. Um, I would just like that justification on where we think we have those funds to have the person we're having. And that's where the efficacy comes in and performance and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So we we will add that probably to the very next, uh, well, not the next meeting, which is all budget, but the next regular meeting. We'll add that to the agenda as well. Okay. Um, next on our list is um, discussion about school committee meetings with students. And unfortunately, we missed the last one. It was last <coughs> Friday, which was a snow day. But um, we've included in this packet a list of the next uh, five occasions. It's the first Friday of the month during the high school students gap period, which is 9, 10 a.m. to 9.38 a.m. And it has been and will be in the foreseeable future still done. <coughs> Yeah, we're still going to do we're going to do them virtually for the foreseeable future. Um, not only because it's more convenient for school committee members, but I don't. Uh, it's not necessary for the kids to meet in person. It's a little bit more convenient for everybody to be able to do it this way. Sorry, did I did I? You froze. Dable, I froze. Yeah, then yep. you froze, and we all froze. And maybe <laughs> I'll just turn my picture off again. See if that helps. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so that's there for people, and we just. Uh, let Tina know so she'll send us the link if we're able to attend them. How much advance notice do you need for that attendance? <clears throat> I, I, I usually send something out at the beginning of the week and talk or, you know, we'll have the school committee meeting on January 25th. So we'll probably right. have it as a reminder then. So it'll be a little bit in advance, but 
having the dates scheduled in, in advance was the request of the committees that more people might be able to make it that way. I would have been there on the 7th, even though I didn't communicate, but it was my birthday, so I did other things. <laughs> Happy oh, birthday. Fine. And you had snow, so good for you. <laughs> um, yes, and I like having the, uh, the uh, list ahead of time because then I'm able to kind of put it in my calendar too. Heather? Happy birthday, Bill. Um, I I don't know if there's anything we can do about the sound. I have no problem with virtual. Um, I don't know if it's just because they're far away. Can we give them even just a silly little computer mic or just something so um, that the speaker is I think, audible? Yeah, I think Tina had an email in which she uh, described how she was going to change it for the better. Tina? Yeah. Yeah, so um, instead of actually doing it in that kind of hybrid mode, um, I'm just actually going to ask our students to also connect with their own um, devices. So that way, but still be um, within the, you know, within the library so that uh, this way they can also be socially distanced even when they're actually connected. So I think that will bring out a better experience for all, everybody. Yes, I think that sounded like a, a better solution. Thank you, Tina, for working that out. And thanks, Heather, for the question. I think that will be more successful. Um, updates from the Six Town Regional Planning Board. There's also an inclusion in the packet of a letter from Alan Genovese, who is chair of the Six Town Regional Planning Board. I believe that's his title. Yep. Um, kind of a general update. Anything else, Bill, you'd like to add? Not at this time. No, I just wanted to provide the committee with a letter that <clears throat> where he just sort of gives an overview of we're waiting for the report from the facilitator to come back right. and uh, they're hopeful to schedule another meeting for the last week of January. Right. Okay. And thanks for putting that in there. Um, and the last item is that we still do have an open Montague School Committee seat. So we'll be willing to appoint someone when we get a letter of interest. I am optimistic that we might get a letter of interest in the near future. And um, as soon as that happens, I won't continue to publicize a, a date by which we need to have it, just that it's available. And I know our reporters, Mike has been very good about putting it in the uh, Montague Reporter and Julian has included it in the recorder as well. So hopefully soon we'll have a full compliment. And that looks like the business list. Uh, we don't have any minutes to approve this time. I expect we'll have some by our next regular meeting. Any agenda requests, please get them to Brian, myself, or Cassie, the vice chair. Um, we generally meet the Tuesday before, it looks like next week, since we're having the extra meeting on Tuesday, we'll probably meet on Monday evening, if that's convenient, we'll be deciding that shortly. Um, the next scheduled meetings are, we have a special meeting on January 18th to review the preliminary budget line items at 6.30 virtually, and then a regular meeting on January 25th, then we will vote on the preliminary fiscal year 23 budget and school choice as well in that meeting. And that will be at 6.30 unless there's an executive session. Bill? Was it, was it this committee that got information about voting on approving minutes that you weren't in attendance? Or is that one of my other positions? No, that was um, sent to us from- uh, Okay, yep from MASC that just clarified the point. I, as well as other people, had been under the impression that if you were not at a meeting, you would not vote to approve the minutes. But then I had heard some years ago that it was perfectly acceptable to mm -hmm. vote on the minutes, even if you were not in attendance at the meeting. Right. No, thank you for um, bringing that forward. Yes, and thank you for reminding me. That is, I believe we all got that email today from Sabrina. Thank you, Sabrina. Yep. Um, looks like we're at the end and we're ready for a motion to adjourn. Move. Bill. Second. And Heather, any discussion about that? 
Okay, in the absence of, I'll have a roll call vote again. Jennifer? Yes. Heather? Yeah. Kimmy? She's there. Yes. Okay, thank you. Bill? I'm sorry, I had to unmute the phone. That's okay, you did it. Yes, Bill? yes. Nick? Yes. Thank you. And thank you, Nick, for also staying with us, even though your connections were having issues tonight as well. And for myself, yes. And thank you all again. Lots of Thanks, good everybody. Work. Thank you. Good See night. See you later.